Hi, I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. And this is Burger of the Week. Each week, we discuss an episode of the Fox animated series, Bob's Burgers, and we create a themed burger based on that episode. This week, we're talking about Season 1, Episode 2, Sacred Cow, which was written by Nora Smith, directed by Jennifer Coyle, and it was aired January 23rd, 2011. The guest actors this week were Paul F. Tompkins, who voices Randy. He does the voice of the yellow Labrador, Mr. Peanut Butter, on BoJack Horseman. We also have Todd Barry, comedian and actor, who voices Melissa. He's had small parts on Dr. Katz, home movies, and others. And we also have Brendan Small, the creator and the lead character in home movies. And uh, he plays the animal control guy. The store next door was Rent Reduced Crime Scene Special. The exterminator van was, again, rats all, folks. We had two burgers of the day. We had Mission Accomplished, which comes with corn salsa. And rest in peas, which comes with snap peas and carrots. Bob celebrates the restaurant's 100,000th burger by putting it on sale for half price. A filmmaker named Randy interrupts his celebration by filming his animal rights documentary right outside the restaurant. Randy ties a cow outside, named Melissa, and explains that he has a challenge for Bob. He can send her to be processed or let her live. Processed. Processed. Slaughtered, is what we're saying. And I feel like Randy and Bob already have got a little thing in common, because they both like terrible puns. Melissa. Oh, no. Melissa and the countdown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody on this show loves puns. Absolutely. Have you seen the names of the stores that they come up with? I mean, they're ridiculous. They're the best. (laughs) Fantastic, but ridiculous. Except for Jimmy Pesto's. It's just his name. Yeah, it's basically like a hit on Olive Garden is what I'm guessing. Is there a guy named Olive Garden? Maybe there is, Jason. (laughs) Don't test me. There could be. That's the creator of Olive Garden, (laughs) Mr. Garden. (laughs) Mr. Garden's coming in. We gotta be on our best behavior. (laughs) So this episode, almost right off the bat, we see a little bit more about Gene's love for music. We see more of his keyboard, and we see his microphone, and he ends up playing it a lot. He brings up music almost throughout the entire episode. He brings up wanting to score Randy's uh, documentary. And it's really great to see Gene's love for music, because that's only kind of touched upon in the few episodes. Like, hey, it's kind of Gene's little quirky thing. But no, it's his passion. He loves music, and we start to see a little bit more of that. I'm going to say pretty much right off the bat that this is not a favorite of mine. This episode kind of bored me. Well, not necessarily bored, but kind of got on my nerves. And the story felt rather simple. And a lot of the B plots, what was going on with Tina, what was going on with Louise, was just not very interesting to me. Okay. Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that you're a vegetarian? Possibly, yeah. I do think that that does play a part in it. I find Linda's attitude towards Melissa to be frustrating because she has zero sympathy, which would be fine if she wasn't the type of person who has sympathy for basically everything. We haven't seen that yet. No, we haven't seen that yet. So I think part of it is frustrating when you're watching it after having seen all of the episodes and going back and rewatching and seeing Linda be so unsympathetic and kind of cruel in a way, like making little jokes, it kind of gets on my nerves. I'm not a huge fan of Linda in this episode, and Linda's probably the one I identify with the most, so this one is (laughs) kind of disappointing in a way to see that she was so, so different than me here. I agree that the episode isn't very strong for the first season. There are some really killer episodes, including the one that we have next week, and even last week's was great. But it still shows growth for all the characters, maybe except for Linda. I don't think Linda goes through any growth in this episode, nor do I really think that Jean does either. I think that Bob is really the shining star of this episode. It's clearly focused on him and his journey, but really he doesn't change by the end of it either. That's what's frustrating to me. He doesn't change. 
Lauren Bouchard is thinking, well, Bob runs a burger place, so what if we have PETA or an animal rights activist try to shut him down? And where's the story here? What can we do with that? And it doesn't really go anywhere. You know, we bring in all these humorous people. We bring in Randy. We bring in Louise and Tina having their sibling rivalry almost. And it just doesn't go anywhere. There's nothing that comes from it. Louise is still a scheming little sister. Tina's still just oblivious to everything around her. Gene, I think he does have some growth, but that's just me. I do love to see him play more of his music. and. Do you find that he's more central to this story than he was in the previous two episodes? Yeah, I feel like all of the kids are a bit more central and they're less background noise and they're, they play a bigger part. I know the B story is a little bit ridiculous, but it's still nice to see them all up front and center a little bit more than the past episodes. Okay, yeah. They felt more like a family to me. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can see that. I definitely understand that point. They do feel more like a family. They are all interacting. And then we'll see later in the episode that they're working together towards a common goal. So that's nice to see. So the first moment where I got a little bit frustrated with this episode was when Linda comes outside to see Melissa and she's got all this meat just all over her. And she goes over to Melissa and she's like petting her and she's laughing about dead cow on live cow. And it was just gross. It I was, know, I know it? it's animated, but it's still gross to think about because that's just so wrong. It is. It's so it's, wrong. It Ugh. is very gross. I did notice that throughout the episode. There are, there are several gross moments that really weren't necessary. And I think, like I've said in previous episodes, they're still trying to compete with the gross out humor of the other shows that are on around the same time so i don't think they've quite got their footing yet they're still tinkering with the show they still are figuring out exactly what the humor of the show is going to be and what fans respond to yes so there was a comment made by bob that sent me sort of into an internet spiral um he mentions that beef comes from steers only so i wanted to see if that was true And he's completely right. Mm -hmm. USDA prime beef is from steers. Mm -hmm. Dairy cows are slaughtered when their milk production falls below a certain level, but their meat is graded low by the USDA because they're older animals. So cow meat would generally go to things like Campbell's soup or Taco Bell meat, but it wouldn't be used for burgers. Well, at least not Bob's burgers because he tends to use very high quality ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I actually didn't know that. Little bit of a lesson there. The publicity attracts more customers, and the Belcher children enjoy Randy and Moulis' presence. Despite this, Bob becomes increasingly frustrated with Randy. Tina believes Moulis is speaking to her through her feces, and Louise assembles a plan to mess with her older sister. Now, what do you think is Louise's plan here? Why does she care so much about messing with Tina? What's the end goal? Louise knows that Tina's not really the smartest cookie in the stack of potatoes (laughs) and so as soon as louise sees an opportunity to mess with her sister her dad her brother her mom anybody she's gonna jump all over it so she sees that tina thinks that the cow is talking to her with poop emojis perfect opportunity to create some poop emojis of her own and again with the poop jokes this is episode three and we're three for three with poop jokes being pretty prominent Yeah, we're still doing that kind of gross out humor a little bit. Yep, absolutely. Yep, okay. When Randy shows the movie clacker and it says dial M for Mooter, (laughs) the only thing I could think of was home movies. It just felt so reminiscent of that show. It was fantastic. I loved it. Absolutely. And having Brendan Small as one of the guest voice actors is even better for that. Yeah, it's perfect. Louise is kind of just outrageous in this part. She keeps calling her father a murderer, saying that he's a bad man who enjoys grinding the meat. And it reminded me of the first episode when she was claiming that her father used human meat. And I have to wonder, does Louise realize that she's potentially putting her livelihood in jeopardy? (laughs) I don't think so. I don't think so either. (laughs) She's an instigator at heart. She was just a troublemaker and she loves to mess with people and we know this and I love seeing it. I love seeing her just 
tell everybody that her dad is a horrible person and he's a murderer and he's a killer and it's just fantastic. I found it kind of tiring in this episode. I thought it was a little bit one note because she just kept saying it over and over and again, just yelling, you know, daddy's a bad, bad man or murderer every time she went outside and it was getting a little bit tiring. <laughs> I love it. I, I think absolutely love if it. if I was Bob, I would have been like, young lady, you are grounded. <laughs> what? Like the beef? <laughs> what? The beef is gr- Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> I just got that. You're terrible. <laughs> no, but I would have probably reprimanded her because He's got other things Terrible. to worry about. I, that's true. He does have other things to worry about, but it was it was getting a little bit annoying for me. It was okay. a little one note, you know. That's fine. Bob has nightmares of killing Melissa and decides to bring her inside his home. Linda's upset, demanding Melissa be removed. When Randy discovers Bob took Melissa inside, he believes his plan is working. So we start Act 3 with the dream sequence, which has one of my favorite lines of this episode uttered by Louise. She's defending her dad in the courtroom. We pan over to see the plaintiff, which is Melissa, kind of chopped up into little bits, which another gross part of this episode. And she screams, that cow is faking her injuries. And it's so funny because it's just a pile of bits and pieces. And it's gross, but it's funny. And she says, I can prove it. So she throws something <laughs> at it. And it's so <laughs> It turns the face and just falls on the ground. <laughs> it's so gross, but it's so funny because it's <laughs> it's completely ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, faking her injuries, and she's just a pile of parts. So yeah, that's my favorite part of the episode. In this section, Tina makes a comment that cows can't go downstairs. Which is a common misconception. Yeah. I believed it. I completely wholeheartedly believe that cows couldn't go downstairs because, I mean, you just look at them and you figure, why should they be able to go downstairs, right? (laughs) Stairs are not a natural thing. It turns out that cows can go downstairs, but that they're generally reluctant to do it because they can't really see their feet. Yeah, they can go down like less steeper inclined stairs, but anything Mm -hmm. where it's like they can't see their feet, like you just said, they... It's not just cows. It's like pretty much any animal that even horses and stuff like that, they have a reluctance to go down well, places stairs are they not, can't see. Yeah, stairs are not found in nature. No, those are man-made things. And not only that, but the stairs up to Bob's apartment. Those or, are some pretty steep stairs. Yeah, those are some very steep stairs. So I completely understand Melissa not at all wanting to move. And for any of you people who have read the fantastic books, uh, the Wayside Stories books. Wayside School is falling down. The very finale, the the culminating act is all these cows climbing up 30 flights of stairs and not being able to go down them because they don't (laughs) go downstairs. So there's hundreds of cows stuck in this school. Well, to be (laughs) honest, I like seeing my own feet if I'm walking down really steep stairs because I get a little bit nervous sometimes. I've fallen downstairs many times in my life. So, I <laughs> I really can't blame cows for being reluctant. Well, at least Linda found a way to semi-harmlessly <laughs> bring her down the stairs by pushing her down a mattress. Uh, another part in this section that I loved was when Teddy signs a re- the release oh form to be in the movie. Teddy, back again. <laughs> and he's acting like he's autographing something, and I just, I love him so much. Every time he shows up, he's just like this pathetic little dog that you want to bring into your house because he's this little mangy stray. (laughs) I don't know. I love him so much. (laughs) I love the interaction between him and Randy because it's very, it feels very improv, kind of like in home movies, just. Yeah, it's a nice thing about these kinds of shows that you can improvise your lines a little bit. You have a little bit of leeway. Well, this is a very unique show in the fact that the voice actors are all in the same room together. No, actually, they're not all in the same room, but they do record together with the New York crew and the LA crew in the same room. They record, I guess, over some sort of video so that they can all be recording at the same time. So a lot of other animated shows will have 
voice actors come in individually when they can on their on their own sort of time and do their lines so they're not able to really riff off of someone else and Mm -hmm. i feel like the way that it's done for bob's burgers gives a much more natural feel to the conversation and it allows the actors to improvise and you know add a little bit to their lines yeah a little bit of their own personality and their own flavor to it and even make adjustments on the fly too if they if they feel like it's necessary Mm-hmm. Melissa spends another night in the Belcher home. Louise continues to mess with Tina, creating a frowny face emoticon with Melissa's feces. Linda uses a mattress to push Melissa down the stairs, and the cow is quickly stolen by the owners of a discount petting zoo. Now let's talk about the discount petting zoo for a second, because that place is creepy as hell. Yes, it is. Okay, I'm glad you agree with me on this, because... That place is horrifying. It's basically the scariest place on earth. And are the animals dead? I think they're all dead because you saw those two mice, like the hickory dickory dot clock. Those two mice are just like dangling off the hands of the clock. And the pig is like strapped to the cart thing. Yeah, he, and, it, looks like, it looks like he has died mm-hmm. and been stuffed and mounted so that he is like posed on this little grocery cart and yep. it freaked me right out. Oh, yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. And then the people, the people for the animals or the discount petting zoo are horrible. They're talking (laughs) about, oh, it's basically an animal sanctuary, except we get money off of it. And H. John Benjamin again, playing the voice of the lady. Oh, really? Okay. The petting zoo was depressing as well. It really reminded me of those petting zoos that you see at fairs and at carnivals where the animals just don't really seem like they've been well taken care of. And they're always just really dirty, really lethargic. And you get all these kids just kind of scrambling to like pet at them. And I'm not a big fan. No. So I didn't like that part of the episode either. (laughs) It seemed very just disjointed with the rest of the episode. Like, hey, let's throw in a random heist. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm totally with Bob on the infrared. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. So I would have probably We're not coming done back the at same nighttime, thing. but we'll use infrared. <laughs> oh. Well then. I would have probably been enchanted by infrared as well. Now that I'm thinking about it, it kind of it's the first time that we see Bob and Randy on the same page. Like that's they're true. working towards yeah. the same goal. The whole family is working towards the same goal. So it makes perfect sense. I like that. That's true. I do like them all working together for a common goal. You know, you see p- two people on either sides of a, ni- a situation and they can find a common ground somewhere. What if it ended very differently? What if the petting zoo turned out to be a really nice place, like a legitimate animal sanctuary, and Bob had a change of heart and he decided to let Melissa stay there? Well, I guess that wouldn't be a change of heart for Bob, but he just lets her stay there. Yeah, doesn't send her to the slaughterhouse. He lets her live in, like, a nice, peaceful environment for the rest of her days. Under the cover of darkness, the Belchers and Randy retrieve Melissa. The cow wanders into the street while Bob and Randy argue and suffers a heart attack after nearly being struck by a car. Tina discovers a heart shape pooped from Melissa, and Bob faints. He has an odd, and vaguely erotic dream, (laughs) of chatting with Melissa where she absolves him of his guilt. We end on a funeral slash 100,000th burger celebration. Vaguely erotic dream. Yeah. Vaguely erotic dream. It's a little bit bit weird. Yeah, it's almost like a dream that Tina would have. Oh, yeah, you're kind of right. I think that this is the first time we have an idea that Bob might not be completely straight. (laughs) Because Melissa... You think he's into bestiality? No, I'm not saying that he's into bestiality, but Melissa is voiced by a man. And not only that, but he was the one at the beginning of the episode who recognized that Melissa was not a female cow. It was a male steer. Mm -hmm. And despite the blonde wig, the way that the cow is sort of presented in the dream, like they've got the big puffed up chest, it is very masculine. Very. So I think we're getting this idea that, you know, maybe Bob just isn't totally straight, which we will see in other episodes. Like there's little hints to it. It's never explicitly said that he's bisexual or anything like that, but I kind of like that it's not... There might be a curiosity there's no, there. Yeah, there's no gay panic no. in this show, which I really appreciate. 
sexuality is never really an issue. No, it's generally embraced. Yeah. And even in this moment when his whole family is watching him and he's sort of making those kissy faces <laughs> and it's very clear that he's talking to Melissa in his dream. His tongue's moving in and out. Oh, and... that's kind of gross. Oh. But they don't seem to judge him for it. They seem to understand that he's coming to terms with something really... It's important for Bob. Yeah, it's important. And I think it was a little bit surprising to him as well. I don't think he expected to ever have sympathy for this cow. But he pretty much immediately shows sympathy towards her. Yeah. And Mulissa makes a comment in the dream that Bob is really just hearing what he wants to hear. He's not really being challenged anymore and he's okay with that because he really wasn't ever going to change his mind anyway. No. Now, this marks one of the first episodes that we see Bob humanizing objects or food. Yes. He actually talks to his burger patty early on. He says, you know, are you going to be the hundred thousandth burger? He, he kind of does the cutesy voice with his, with his food. It's his little personality bits and pieces that kind of shine through that nobody really sees. That's just for us. His family isn't there. His kids aren't there. Well, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. He just does it because that's, Bob, who, Bob that's who Bob is. Yeah. I think Bob had a lonely childhood and we know that Bob had a lonely childhood. So some of his past mannerisms from when he was a kid, you know, come through every once in a while to make him feel comfort and to make him happy when he's alone. Yeah. I don't know. I talk to random things, so I get it. I understand <laughs> why Bob does it. I think it's really cute. And I think we all do it. Yeah, I think we all do it. So I think overall, talking about the episode, I'm pretty much right where I was before. I still think that this is not the best season one episode, and it's probably, if we were ranking the episodes like on a big list or something, it would probably be near the bottom for me. Ouch. Yeah, it's not a favorite of mine. It's okay. There are moments that I like. I do like Melissa. I think Melissa's cute. Despite not saying anything for 90% of her screen time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jason, do you have anything for your burger of the week? Am I going to beat you this week? Okay. So far, listeners, I've won one of the burgers of the week. I won most recently. <laughs> yep. I'm a veteran. <laughs> okay, okay. And you won the first episode. So what the do you have for me? first episode counts for like 10. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. I have two burgers this week. I have the Steer Me Right Burger. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because it's a male steer. And it would come with saffron mayo because saffron is yellow. And putting it with mayo would make it all yellow, just like Melissa's wig. Okay? Perfect. That would be an expensive burger. Yeah, probably because saffron is expensive. So Bob would likely have to up his prices for that burger the day. Or... I have squash this beef burger because <laughs> Melissa dies. I don't know. Oh, I don't wow. know. <laughs> it's a That's... little dark, I guess. You wouldn't want it for the end of the episode. That got dark. But, you know, squash and beef, like, it works on two levels because Randy and Bob sort of squash their beef. And then, you know, if you're going to have ground beef, you're going to have to squash it into a patty. Anyway. And it would come with butternut squash. Like Like a slice on the burger or on the side? I think either way, honestly. It could come like kind of mashed up on the burger Mm. or like little slices of it or it could be on the side. That'd be interesting to have uh, slices of squash on there or even like mashed up into a sauce or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe like a little spread. Yeah, it could could be be interesting. Yeah, it could be good. All right, so try and beat me. What do you got this week? So... I guess we kind of both came up with the name of this one. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely came up with the name of this one. It's the Memorial Burger. Terrible. I love it. (laughs) And so it would pretty much be a regular burger. But in honor of Melissa, there would be strands of cheese, like cheese string, into hair and top of the burger bun. So it's spread out like it's a hair, like it's a wig. That is so weird. I'm, I'm, <laughs> listeners, I'm giving him the weirdest looking face right now. I'm a little bit So you out. make a wig out of the little cheese string bits. You've always done, you've always, you know, you peel it and you've got the little hair and you're like, ooh, wee, waving it around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then you just put it in the bun so it looks like your bun's wearing a wig. 
Yeah. Or you could have you could have a black bun because your burger would be appropriately dressed for a memorial. So everything <laughs> would be black. Yeah. You could have black garlic on it. You could um Your lettuce would be so wilted it's black. That's a little gross, but sure. Pickled in black brine. Well, you could have like a purple kind of lettuce. Like a maybe, like a dark, dark maybe kind of lettuce. Oh yeah, you could have beets. You could dye them. So all all of your ingredients would be nice and dark so that black your burger olives. Oh yeah. So that your burger is appropriately dressed for a memorial. So who wins this week, Jason? I don't know. I'm feeling a little torn. I feel like all of our ideas are pretty good. But maybe we share this win with Memorial Burger? <laughs> we could share it or we could leave it up for the listeners to decide. Oh, I like that one. Except we do have to call the episode something. That's true. Listener's choice? <laughs> yeah, we could put it on Twitter and have people vote, see what burger ends up being the most popular all right listener so leave a comment below if you're on our website or you could tweet us at multiverse radio yeah or send them a message on facebook facebook.com slash multiverse radio podcast or you can email us at info at multiverse radio.ca all right and that brings us to the end of burger of the week a multiverse radio production if you like our show please leave a rating and review on itunes and you can follow us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. You can also visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. We'll see you next week for our review of episode four, Sexy Dance Fighting, where we finally get to see Gyro. <laughs> <laughs> it comes with corn salsa. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. It's not funny. Okay. You're kind of like Bob now. You think it's hilarious. <laughs> We had mission a corn pushed. <laughs> Maybe you need to do this part. Because <laughs> I can't do it. Does that mean Bob is a very lonely man? Yes. Oh. We know that. That's super sad. <laughs> That's like really upsetting.